we continue our journey through the Vatican Apostolic Library, founded by Pope Nicholas V in the middle of the 15th century. After accessing the library through the Galleria Lapidaria, the Lapidary Gallery, an old entrance created during the pontificate of Sixtus V, we now go to one of the most interesting rooms of this institution, located on the highest floor of the building, the Sistine Hall. With an area of 1,000 square meters, it was considered for centuries the largest consultation room in Europe. Divided into two large halls, both 70 meters long, illuminated by the natural light of 14 windows, the Sistine Hall is a masterpiece of the fresco painting technique. The iconographic cyclical design adorning it revolves around a main theme, the celebration of the book and the written word. If a visitor enters through the door that connects the vestibule with the Sistine Hall, he'll come face to face with a central row of pillars covered in fresco paintings that tell the story of alphabets. We see these pillars tell the story of alphabets, the origins in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Greece, Latin, all the way on forward to the Etruscan and Armenian alphabet uh, and the, the alphabets of the Slavic peoples. This brings out a key element, uh, pillars holding up the pontifical library, that this apostolic library exists because letters are the basis of writing down words. And by having these different alphabets, the languages of the human race can be expressed in letters that conform to the sounds each language makes. And this is what makes possible human words being sent to other places where the speaker is not. You can send a message far away. After the history of the alphabets on the central columns, the iconographic cyclical design continues along the two side walls where frescoes tell the history of the libraries. The history of the library is told from antiquity to the Renaissance era, and there's also the history of the ecumenical councils. But also, as this apostolic library witnesses to, you can have human words be passed on into the future generations. People can speak abroad and people can speak through time because of writing, an amazing human invention. But we also see portrayed in the frescoes on one wall a history of the libraries, beginning with Moses putting the law of God in the care of Aaron the priest. And then later on, we see Esdras also, after the exile in Babylon, starting a Hebrew library. It portrays the other great libraries of the world, the library at Athens, where the Greeks began to collect their books, the library in Babylon, which also has within it Daniel being involved in that knowledge so that a religious person from our own faith tradition of ancient Israel is involved in that. And then we see how the last king of the Romans tried to burn a book that he didn't find uh, complimentary to him, the Sibylline Oracles, he burned all but two. But then later on, the Emperor Augustus collects books and his reign becomes a period of the great collecting of books. We see also the libraries that develop by Christians in the great city of Jerusalem, 
Christian fathers gathered together books. And then in the city of Caesarea Maritima, which was in fact the political capital, more Christian books are gathered with the great scholar of the Bible, uh, Origen, as part of that, the first one to compare different texts of the Bible. We also have the great library begun with the apostles at Rome, but then culminating also in Rome with the popes gathering books. And from the earliest centuries, the popes made collections. And in one sense, we see that this library, which was begun by Pope Nicholas and continued on through the centuries, gathers these books here. The church cares deeply about passing on the knowledge, and it's the knowledge of all things. This is important for us to understand the nature of this library. But then, finally, we also see that the other wall is filled with frescoes of the histories of the great councils of the church. And this is key for understanding the purpose of this library. On one hand, various people used human logic to try and understand God. But when they reduced God to their own logic, and they didn't let the Word of God, the Scriptures, widen their knowledge, then we see that they made mistakes and committed a great sin called heresy, which is to take a part of the truth out of the context of the whole of truth. And what they do at these councils, beginning with Nicaea in 325, is bring together the knowledge of God in Scripture. That's why in every council, the Bible is enthroned at the very center of the council. But they use human logic, human knowledge, submitted to the revelation by God. And they work through the difficulties. People like Arius, who denied the divinity of Christ, said, no, he's just a superhuman and with a super being. Then we see later on at the Council of Constantinople that they are also working through the denial of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And then we see the problem that came at the Council of Ephesus, where they did not understand the way that Christ is a divine person with two distinct natures. And that's the council where they understood that Mary's the mother of God because Jesus is God. She didn't give him divinity, but he is divine. They go on with the other councils, dealing with a variety of problems, such as does Christ have one will or does he have two wills, a human will and a divine will? In other words, is he truly human and divine as applying to his will? Then we see that they deal with questions like, can you have images? All of these are brought together at these councils to work out the combination of human science and most importantly, divine science and resolving that wisdom. And without a library like the great apostolic library here at the Vatican, we would have no way to help that knowledge come together. And this is a terrific service of the church to aid us in this deeper understanding of all knowledge as well as the knowledge of God as God reveals himself.